students. I am Christine Moore, your Orange County Commissioner for District 2, right where your school is located. Today I'm standing in beautiful Magnolia Park and we're going to be exploring all kinds of things about Apopka. You'll be reading my book and you'll be asking questions, discovering things you never knew anything about. And at the end of the process, you will earn an AHA Popka badge. Let's get started. Good morning, Mr. Dunn. Good morning, Commissioner. It's so nice of you to join me and the friends of Lake Apopka have meant so much to me and this lake. Could you tell me a little bit more about your organization and how you've helped our lake and our Lake Apopka? Be an honor and a privilege. Um, about 30 years ago, Lake Popka, the fourth largest lake in Florida, was the most polluted lake in Florida. And a biologist by the name of Jim Thomas started the Friends of Lake Apopka to get citizens aware of the issues with restoring the lake and protecting it. So we're about citizen advocacy, which is really just everyday people trying to make sure that everybody's aware of this lake and how far it's come and that we still have ways to go. And I know that you've been responsible for many of the items here in Magnolia Park. And one of the uh, items is a timeline. And in there you talked about something very significant in the life of the lake in the late 1800s. Can you tell students a little bit about what happened at that time? Absolutely. Well, Lake Apopka is the headwaters of the Akalawaha River Basin, which simply means that the water flows from Lake Apopka north up all the way to Jacksonville, Florida, which is unusual because most rivers flow north to south in North America. The farmers on the south shore of Lake Apopka needed a way to get their crops and produce and citrus up to Jacksonville. So then at that port, it could go north to the northeastern United States. So they dug a seven mile canal from Lake Apopka up to Lake Beauclair in order for ships to be able to navigate all the way up to Jacksonville. Now, that was a positive economic uh, motivation. They were trying to do the right thing. But unfortunately, in the many years that it took them to build the canal, by the time they finished, trains came along and the canal was obsolete at that point. It also had the effect of lowering Lake Apopka by three feet, which is quite a bit because the lake was more, almost twice the size it is now. It was 50,000 acres, and when you take that big lake and drain three feet out of it, it makes a difference. It creates a very shallow lake, and large shallow lakes are susceptible to things that happen later. Right, and speaking of later, and of course we had fish rodeos, and we were still enjoying a lot of years of the lake being in good condition, but some things started in the 1930s that really weren't helpful to this lake. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? In the beginning of the 30s, the lake was idyllic. Crystal clear, sandy bottom, lots of plants, and, and the eastern United States capital of bass fishing. There were 29 fish camps around the lake. And a fish camp is just a cabin with a little dock that sits right on the lake, and people would come and stay overnight and fish. And it was so incredibly popular that people came from all over. But then in the early 1940s in World War II, the country needed food. So they built a dam across the top northern part of Lake Apopka, pumped all that water out, and the bottom of the, the lake on the north side was very fertile because it had been underwater. They grew um, corn, uh, vegetables, all kinds of things for the war effort. And then after the war, those farms continued. So for the next 50 years, those farms put fertilizer and pesticides on their crops. And some of that fertilizer was pumped back into the lake. Some of it ran off because of rain. The pesticides got into the lake and it created quite a few issues for the lake. And that's how the lake ended up becoming lime green. Wow, so to start off again, we had a need to feed people. True. And we knew that the, the land was very fertile, would make terrific farmland but it's always the worry about unintended consequences. And so we always have a lot of debates about why that happened. And the story today is really for us to teach the students these stories so that they can avoid some of these unintended consequences and learn from 
our mistakes and our forebears' uh, mistakes as well. So eventually, um, by the 1970s, what happened to our beloved Lake Apaka? So all that fertilizer went into the lake and fed the algae, which is a small microscopic plant. And that, normally algae is a good thing, but with all the fertilizer, they got really hungry and really mm. fed, well fed, and they took over the lake. So the surface of the lake was green with algae and that blocked the light from getting into the lake, which hurt the plants. It killed almost all of the plants in the lake. It forced the bass to, to uh, go to other lakes because the low oxygen content that with no, no sunlight getting through and the dead plants falling to the bottom and creating muck. So it really basically turned into an ecological disaster. And that's when Jim Thomas um, raised the alarm and said, we can't allow this to keep happening. They tried to work with the farmers to limit the fertilizer, but that just wasn't practical. So in the end, it, Friends of Lake Apopka worked with the Florida legislature to buy all of the farms on the North Shore. And that was the pivot point that changed the entire restoration of the lake because once that, fer that fertilizer and those pesticides were gone, then the lake could start to recover. And St. John's River Water Management District, who manages the North Shore now, turned it into a natural wetlands. So that was part of the, a key element of the restoration process. In the 1970s, we know that the pesticides and the DDT and the fertilizers had really accumulated in the lake. Did the lake die or what actually happened to it? The lake didn't die itself, but it was significantly altered. Birds ate food, rodents, plants, fish that had been poisoned by pesticides and they died. The game fish went away because they couldn't exist without the oxygen and scavenger fish came in, bottom feeders called gizzard shed that basically took over the lake and concentrated the phosphorus. Alligators had difficulty breeding. And in fact, there were tales of alligators with three eyes and white alligators and mutant alligators. So it did have a very, very negative effect on the lake. But the district has a couple of major projects that they're ongoing. One's called the Marsh Flowway. And it's in the upper left-hand corner of the lake. And it's basically four big ponds with a lot of plants in them. The water flows into the pond, slowly, gently goes through the ponds and the phosphorus drops to the bottom. And then they pump the clean water back into the lake. And about once every five or 10 years, they have to clean out the pond and scrape all the phosphorus that's gone down to the bottom. But that circulates the entire volume of the lake, 70 billion gallons of water, once every year and a half. And all these things came back to how we took care of the lake. That's really amazing to me how science is so interrelated. And as we take more time to learn our science and learn about these chemicals, the phosphorus and the nitrogen, it's helped us to have these biologists to come back in and, and repair this lake. So for thousands and thousands of years, the lake was in terrific condition through the Native Americans. We had a wonderful Chief Kawakachi who walked these shores and the, they used this lake for travel, for food, for water, for bathing. And then in really just a few decades, we, we destroyed this lake and it's taking even longer, don't you think, than it, to what the time to destroy it. It's taking us even longer to see it come back, but we're learning. With them doing all of those things, we've made huge progress in the last 20 years, but you, it's, you cannot pollute a lake for 50 years and get well in 20. No. So we have to keep going. And the St. John's River Water Management District has some amazing science projects. One that's about two miles up from here where they're chemically removing phosphorus from the lake and they're increasing the vegetation and they have dredging projects because over that 50 years, all those plants died and settled to the bottom of the lake. There's a foot or two of, of muck down there now that used to be sand. So they have plans over time to dredge that muck out, that removing the phosphorus, removing the muck through dredging will make the lake clearer. Yes, and all of that costs money, millions and millions of dollars. And boys and girls, 
where you come in and where I come in as elected official, we have to make this a priority because there's not enough money to fund everything we want to. I've seen estimates for this dredging at 200 million dollars, which we don't currently have. And so it's very important that we as the public, as families and communities say that this is something we value. We want this lake back to its pristine condition because we know it impacts the animals, the birds, the vegetation, our quality of life. I mean, I always say, so goes Lake Apopka, so goes Apopka. And so, if, is there anything you'd like to say to the boys and girls about their role as they become adults and responsible for this area that you'd like them to remember about this history of this lake? Well, to your point, restoration is very expensive and we need to continue to do it. This lake has made tremendous progress in the last 20 years. And if we keep going and do spend money over time, and we have to be careful because it is expensive, we can get this lake back to the way it was. But the right thing to do is to never let a lake get to this stage in the first place, because preventing pollution of lakes is much less expensive than restoring lakes. Right, so to talk about that just for a second, uh, I know that if we live on a lake, we have to be careful about not getting fertilizer into the lake because that's the chemicals, the phosphorus, the nitrogen, and that upset that delicate balance. Is there any other advice you could give to our families if they live near a body of water, what to be careful of? I think that's extremely important, probably number one, because in specifically this lake has a tiny little spring, but that's not what feeds this lake. This lake is fed by rain and runoff. So when it rains and all that water rushes to the lake and it goes across a lawn and picks up fertilizer and puts it into the lake, we're undoing some of that progress that we've made for the last 20 years. So there are rules and summer moratoriums because that's when it's hottest and when we get the most rain and keep the fertilizer out of the yards and out of the lake. So anybody that lives anywhere near the basin, it's called, the area around the lake, not just right on the lake, but the area around the lake, especially like a lake, uh, uh, Lake Apopka, where runoff is its principal um, mechanism of getting water, that water has to be clean and fertilizer free. And because we've made such good progress in the last 20 years, Lake Apopka has become a destination for ecotourism. People come to the North Shore to the Wildlife Drive. And in the winter, there are 350 species of birds at the, at the North Shore. And that's because it's been restored as a natural wetlands. The birds are migrating. They see this big lake with 20,000 acres of beautiful wetlands. And they stop and they stay and they breed. And people come from all over the country, including outside of the country to come to that wildlife drive. It's become a cycling destination. We have great trails around the lake. So more and more as the lake recovers, it has an economic impact as well as an ecological impact. Well, we thank you so much. The Friends of Lake Apopka, I hope you're gonna stay active and engaged in this process because we're not done. And I think there will always be the importance of educating and talking about what we have to do as citizens to keep our bodies of water beautiful and pristine and healthy. So thank you, Mr. Dunn, so much for being here with me. Thank you, Commissioner, for all you do. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you. Edgewood Greenwood Cemetery in downtown Apopka where it all began and I have a very special guest with me Dr. Phyllis Olmsted who will talk to us about what buildings were here and why this is such a significant location to our history. Dr. Olmsted welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Dr. Olmsted can you tell us what famous buildings were located right here in this Edgewood Greenwood Cemetery? Well just behind us was the Baptist Church, and on the Baptist Church property, they allowed to be built the first public school. And it was right here, and immediately in front, they started burying the first pioneers. And so what year would that have been, and what would the building have been made out of? 
Well, it was made out of regular sheets of pine, pine wood, and it didn't last very long. Uh, the building, we have all the history on it in different places in the museum, and we also have it online. And then the school moved somewhere else, so where was the next school building? It was built down, um, down the road uh, towards uh, Main Street, and then eventually it went to where the giant uh, tree is, sycamore tree is, down by City Hall, where the Chamber of Commerce is. And then that was torn down by a tornado. And then eventually uh, two buildings were built, uh, one where City Hall is now and beside it. And then eventually they went on to where the middle school is now. Uh, Dr. O, we come to cemeteries to celebrate our loved ones and perhaps do some genealogy and study into famous people. In the book Aha Popka, I write about a very wonderful woman, Catherine Kitland Nelson. She is buried here. Can you tell us why we want to remember her? She did so much charitable work in the community. Uh, she lived for 73 years and was in every single charity, community organization. She did incredible work. She started many of the local community organizations. She was a charter member of one of our, what we call our women's club here, but it has a, a special charter name. She started with the Foliage Club. She started, she was a member of the Chamber of Commerce and was the citizen of the year. Um, and that year they recognized her as having begun and ended over two dozen major accomplished projects, very important um, projects. Her son, uh, one of her three children, uh, Stephen, remarked that she even bought an insurance policy to endow a uh, orphanage project because she believed in, in orphans so much and, and she adopted children. And her family, they were in the uh, rose business as it were many of the early families, whether it was farming or oranges and later the indoor foliage. And then she had some pretty famous relatives who, who was also in her family. Well, her brother, she had a brother called John Hoarding Land, and his plot is just behind us. Um, he was the longest serving mayor in the nation full time. And so how did that park get named after her? Well, within less than 24 hours after her death, a couple of citizens went to the city council and asked that because of all of her tremendous community service that they named the park after her. Yeah, she's such a wonderful woman. An example to, to all our young ladies in town. Um, now, one of the other things that I really admire you for is that you uh, have and I have brought children here before, and we talk to them about etiquette or how they should behave when they're in the cemetery. Can you share a few of those details with us in case any of the families would like to come up here on their own? Well, one thing is, you know, we have inside and outside voices. Well, it's outside, and people, children run around, and they, they, they're outside, they think it's a playground. It's out of respect for the family members that come and go out here that you don't use your outside voice out here. Um, it, some cemeteries are tree covered and some aren't. It doesn't matter that something's over your head or not for an outside voice. It's a matter of that there are other people here praying or they're visiting their loved ones. So you keep an inside voice and whisper and talk and pray here. Uh, another thing is, is think of a bed that they're laying there in that space and there's a bed coming out from their tombstone if, the, if it's not rocked off. Don't go running or walking across that area. And one other thing we tend to do uh, when we come to the cemetery is put flags um, for, for the folks who had served in the military. What can you tell us about that? S former slaves started putting up for people who from the north who had died in the south and their bodies had not been returned to the north and they were going out and honoring their dead. So they decided since no one was there to honor the dead that had fallen from the north, they went ahead and put out flowers and things for the ones who had died from the north. So that became Memorial Day eventually and to memorialize all those who had died. 
in the war. And every Memorial Day, we come out and we put flags for anyone who died in a war. Veterans Day is different. It's for those who have served at all and whether they died or not. So we have two different times. Uh, at Memorial Day, they come and meet across here underneath at the Memorial Stadium over here and everybody gathers and the VFW um, gets together the Veterans of Foreign Wars and puts on a beautiful ceremony and then everyone gathers flags and places them on all the graves of everyone who served male, female, black, white, Native American, Asian, it doesn't matter, any theater of war or from any uh, country. So we have people that have served from England or Australia. They weren't American, but they served in war. Well, you are a wealth of information. I could talk to you for another hour. I wish we had more time. It's a little hot. We're out here in August, but I want to really, really thank you, Dr. Olmsted, for being here with me today. And thank you for encouraging students as a former teacher in Orange County and internationally um, for teacher educators. I want to thank you for encouraging kids to learn outside of the classroom and to learn about their community and about nature. And to me, preserving a cemetery is a very important process of preserving nature. this large sycamore tree to learn more about the history of this area with the help of Apopka Fire Chief Chuck Carnesale. Hi Chief, can you tell me why this tree has such significance to you and the community? Absolutely and, and thank you for uh, inviting me to do this. Uh, we miss having the children out here and I hope this doing it virtually will uh, give them something to, uh, to think about and uh, let them uh, learn a little bit more of Apopka history. So this is, the, this is an American sycamore. It's also known as the John Land tr sycamore tree. Uh, it was named after uh, former mayor John Land who served as mayor for 63 years here in Apopka. And it was planted in 1900. So that makes it about 120, maybe 121 years old, depending on how old it was when they planted it. So you figure about 120. It was planted in 1900 by a gentleman by the name of Parker Dodge Shepherd, also known as P.D. Shepherd, and he was one of the original founding settlers of the town of Apopka. So he planted two trees. He planted this one, and it was on the east side of the Apopka Union School, which sat just beyond us here. And then about 100 feet uh, to the west, he planted another tree the same day. And that's really the significance of the, uh, the tree. It was, it's 120 years old, planted by one of the original settlers of Apopka. Now the students have gone to the uh, cemetery and seen the original site of the very first wooden schoolhouse. Yes. So this Union Schoolhouse, can you tell us a little bit more about the construction and where it was in relationship to the tree? Absolutely, it was a, a two-story wood frame structure and construction started in 1896 and finished up in 1897. And it sat about 50 feet just beyond this tree, right over here in the circular area. And it was doing great for about 20 years. And then um, January 11th, 1918, something happened to the town of Apopka that changed it forever. Um, about nine o'clock that evening, a tornado came off of Lake Apopka and traveled northeast. And Basically, when it got to the uh, downtown section of Apopka, most of it was destroyed by this tornado, including the, Union, the Apopka Union School. It actually flipped the school upside down, and not only did it destroy the school, it also took out and killed the second sycamore tree that was planted on the other side. However, this sycamore tree survived. And before the actual tornado, the two trees were known as the queen and the king. So the king didn't survive, but this is the queen sycamore tree that, that did survive. And there are some uh, activities and things that you had done well, Chief, to try to remember the significance of this tree. What did you do um, to help keep this memory alive? Well, first of all, the tree wasn't doing that well a few years ago. So uh, fortunately, we had a, the city commission put some money into um, getting an arborist out here and figuring out what we needed to do to keep the tree 
alive uh, much longer. The average lifespan of a sycamore tree is about 100 years, so we're past that, and we're lucky we have that. But I just felt like the, hit, the, the tree has so much history. This is where all the children gathered back in the day from the Apopka Union School under this tree. They had luncheons, played recess, they had all kinds of things out here. And just sitting as fire chief, when I was sitting in my office, I had a direct view of this tree and I kept looking at it a few years back and it just wasn't looking healthy. So the city jumped in, they did some work to it uh, with the help of an arborist and it's actually thriving quite well today. Did you enter this tree in any kind of competition? I did, back in, uh, I think it was 2011, uh, the Orange, Orange County had a contest for the uh, most uh, significant or historical tree in Orange County. So I submitted this tree as, uh, you know, to see what would happen and actually I won. <laughs> so uh, we had uh, Commissioner Brummer at the time came out here along with Mayor Land and uh, presented me a plaque with a picture of this tree on it. But they also presented me a very small sycamore tree. and. Uh, I wasn't gonna take the tree home. I wanted to do something with that tree. So I asked Mayor Land if I could donate it to the city and plant it here on the lawn of City Hall. And he said, absolutely. And right now it's over there about a hundred yards away. It's about nine years old and it's doing great. It really is. And then we did something at a Pop Elementary a couple of years ago when I was the school board member. We had a celebration. And if I remember correctly, it was a hundred years of remembering the tornado that had destroyed the original Apopka Union School. And on that day that we were remembering, what did we do at Apopka Elementary School? We planted another sycamore tree. <laughs> and I haven't been by there recently, so hopefully it's doing well, but uh, that was a great experience being able to put that tree in the ground over there. Well, what else, is there anything else you would like the students to know about the City Hall grounds here? What you're <laughs> holding in your I'm hands? I'm sure everyone's wondering, what is this? So. This tree has been through a lot. Not only the tornado of 1918, during the 1940s, during World War II, uh, an Apopka citizen by the name of Jack Grossenbacher was in the service and he was flying his P-38 airplane, fighter airplane. He was gonna do a flyby of the newer school that was built after the Union School. And he got a little too low and he clipped the top of uh, this tree and took off about 20 feet of the tree. So it's not as tall as it used to be. So it's been through that. And then in 2005, with our regular afternoon uh, uh, thunderstorms we have here in Florida, a microburst, a severe storm came through and knocked off another limb of the top of the, uh, the tree. And as we firefighters, a bunch of firefighters came out, we were cleaning up, helping the grounds crew clean up the mess. This, this was left and I picked this up. I said, you know what, I'm gonna keep this because someday I might be able to use it as a prop to, to show some, uh, some of the kids what, uh, what actually transpired here. So this is a, uh, a branch from the 2005 storm, a branch of the tree that came off. That's so exciting. And of course it survived three hurricanes. It did. In 2004. It's Charlie, Francis, and Jean, yep. And then in 2017, Hurricane Irma. Yep. So this tree could tell us some stories, we would learn so much about the history of Apopka. Absolutely, and, and you brought up Hurricane Irma. Like I said, my office was right behind us in the main fire department headquarters, and I kept looking out the window during the hurricane to make sure this tree was still here, and it was. It lost some branches then too, but she's smiling down on us. She's doing well. This is the queen. This is the queen. So, well, we thank you, Chief, for thank all you, you've done. Thank you. You've done so much to keep the story of this tree alive. And it's through these memorials that we can understand and gravitate and do our part to make this city a wonderful place to live. Thank you. And thank you for all the work you're doing. You're welcome. of Apopka City Hall at the 9-11 Memorial with Eagle Scout Christian Lamphere students to help you understand why this is here, why we have memorials, and why it is so important to remember the tragedy of 9-11. And Christian, I have followed you through this whole process and now you're a senior at Apopka High School. But when you were in middle school, you decided um, as you were trying to achieve your Eagle Scout to do a project. How did you choose this project 
And what motivated you to get all of this work done? So when I was in middle school, um, we uh, went up to Baltimore, and so um, while we were in Baltimore, we w uh, we wanted to go to go do something. So we decided to go to uh, New York, and so while we were there, we uh, stopped by the 9/11 memorial they have in New York, and that all, that uh, influenced me to do the project, as well as um, my father was a firefighter for the city for 25 years and a lieutenant, and my grandfather was also a, a fire chief up in um, Vermont, and th all those factors. Um, kind of influenced me to build a project. But why here? Why at City Hall? Uh, because this is like this, uh, like a main spot, and uh, people drive by it a lot, so people can see it as they're driving by on the uh, main road. And as you got into the project, I know you ran into some difficulties. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So the main the main thing we were uh, having problems with was just waiting, because for the piece it oh, was taking a while to um, get one because we got put on a waiting list and then so um, after a while we got a phone call saying we uh, got a piece and all and um, other pro uh, some other problems were um, mainly just getting the money to fundraise for it and then after I got that it was uh, there was like a couple little things that happened but we got past it and we uh, finished the project. Christian, in completing this project, I understand you had to travel to bring this project into reality. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? So I went up to uh, Pennsylvania with Ed Velasquez and um, we drove up there and got the piece of granite. And while we were there, we also went to a, um, we went to the crash site of Flight 93. So we visited that part of 9-11 uh, as well. And um, th with this project, we uh, went up to DC with my troop. And so while we were in DC, we went to go see the Pentagon as well. And so we stopped by, so I was able to go and uh, see the Pentagon in person. And um, that was, for that, for the traveling and stuff, for the project, that would, that's about it for uh, the traveling part. And what do you hope as students come visit this memorial, what do you hope that they take away from their visit? Well, obviously that this was an important part of history and that it affected a lot of people in life because uh, they lost their loved ones or friends. And so um, I want them just to take away this moment and realize like what happened in the past and just remember of all those people who have uh, lost their lives on this day, uh, on 9-11. And what would, did you want children to remember about the dedication and service of our first responders? That they uh, put a lot on the line when, um, when they go out and serve our country and that um, they uh, and that they um, just put a, they just have a big sacrifice that they give when they uh, go to protect us. And how long did it take you to complete the entire project? It took me a year to finish the project. An entire year. And I know Boy Scouts really um, are such the backbone of making improvements and taking care of projects. Your troop has had numerous Eagle Scouts. It's Troop 10, is that right? Troop 211. 211, and where do you meet? We, le uh, we meet off on to a scout house, um, just a couple blocks away from here. Is it at the, the United Methodist yeah. Church? You have quite the facilities there. Don't you have a house and some yeah, other buildings? A, yeah, we have a little scout house that we meet every Tuesday night. Well, I just can't even imagine being here without this 9-11 memorial. It's meant so much to so many of us. and. We really thank you for your patience and your hard work and your diligence to see it through to, to completion. of Apopka City Hall in front of the 9-11 memorial created by Christian Lamphere, an Eagle Scout, and former commissioner, Diane Velasquez, who was instrumental in assisting or helping Christian to complete this memorial. Hello, Commissioner Velasquez. Well, could you tell us a little bit more about how you got involved to help Christian? Actually, I was the sitting commissioner in uh, 2015 and Christian and his dad had uh, come to the council meeting and initially what he wanted to do was 
to give them or to ask the mayor if it was uh, uh, his uh, intention of building a 9-11 memorial and he wanted to honor the first responders and he was sort of in the very beginning stages and I think what he really wanted at that time was to suggest just to get some permission to be able to build it on city property. And his initial intent was at the Gilmore Center where the firemen uh, train. And uh, so he presented what his Eagle Scout project was gonna be about. And the mayor was on board and said, you know, whatever he needed, uh, assistance from the city, from the staff, that we would do, we would be of assistance to him if he needed us. And then at the end of the council meeting, when it was adjourned, his dad and Christian uh, approached me and basically they said to me, we understand that you are a retired uh, detective from New York City and we would like to ask you if you can help us. And that's really the beginning of how I got involved. I was excited for him when he presented it, but I was even more excited that he asked me to be a partner in it and to help him, uh, you know, build this 9-11 memorial. Of course, what they asked me was to help them get a piece because they had gone to, uh, they had already uh, solicited through certain public officials if they can help them and, and he was kind of striking out. No one was able to help him. When I look at it, I, I think it was very providential that you were on the city council at that time yes. because you were a previous detective for New York City and your husband yes. also. And so as the project ensued, Christian had many, many struggles. How did your experience in your jobs, both you and your husband, assist in this coming to light? Well, it was, um, first of all, uh, my husband, Ed, he was part of the recovery during 9-11, following 9-11. He worked there for almost four months. He was part of that. Uh, and it's really just networking, knowing who to contact. And uh, at the time, my first partner from the police department, her name is Lieutenant Karen Lamell, and I have to give her a lot of credit. I reached out to her and told her, this is this project, this Eagle Scout project. Uh, I, I need to have a contact. Can you tell me what the process is and how I can go about soliciting a, uh, a piece of the Twin Towers? And it was through her that I started this process. And I always find that pretty amazing that you were here at that time and yes. you were able to make the phone calls to New York to yes. secure the pieces. Yes. But then you and your husband got more and more involved. We and, did. And Ed, your husband, uh, really was instrumental in getting Christian and his dad to get some of these pieces. Yes, yes. Well, once I started the process of really phone calls, emails, and going from uh, the New Jersey Port Authority uh, to the New York City Police Department, uh, it involved a, a, it involved probably about eight uh, people from New York City. And finally, I was sent an email from uh, the New York, New Jersey, New York Port Authority and was told that I had made the list because they had a certain list. At that time, I kind of have to just backtrack a little bit. They were building the Freedom Tower. So all the pieces of the building, the trucks, the cars, the pillars, everything that had been recovered was sitting at a hangar at the John F. Kennedy Airport. So they were going to that particular hangar and retrieving these, these pieces that had been recovered and they were using it for the museum. So at that time, they were not awarding anything. You were kind of put on a list and once they were completed with what they needed for their museum, then they had uh, decided that they were going to distribute the rest. And so that's how I made that list. So that was in April of 2016. And we started this process during the holidays. And it was kind of January and February where I was consistent in calling every week um, and just following up, because that's, that's usually the process. You, when you follow up, they don't forget that, you, that you're interested. 
So how did the pieces actually get transported to Florida for Christian's project? Okay, so that was um, in April, once I was told that I was awarded the piece, I received another email that the city of New York was going to distribute everything that was left at the JFK hangar, and they gave us three days. They gave us May 11th, 12th, and 13th. That was it. Whatever was left at, J at the hangar was all going to be given away, and they were going to close the hangar up. That's it. They were going to close its doors, and there would be no more storage of any piece that was recovered from 9-11. So my husband, Ed, drove all the way to New York. We told him that we would be there May 11th. He drove all the way to New York and was there early in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning on May 11th, stood online with firemen, everyone who was being awarded a piece. And we were all given a number of the piece that we were going to be awarded. And uh, so he was the one that went down and picked up the piece. And actually all the firemen helped him to kind of wrap this around as best as they could on the back of his truck. And he literally drove a day and a half with only stopping once at a truck stop with this piece on the back of his truck. That is quite a commitment of your husband. We're so grateful for his and yours, of course, your effort on our behalf. Now, did you take another trip that, this time with Christian? We did. Uh, once we started the project and we kind of knew how we were going to uh, place the project and the structure, uh, Christian wanted something from where Flight 93 in Pennsylvania, he wanted something from there. And uh, so my husband volunteered and drove uh, Christian Lampier and his dad, Phil, he drove all the way to Pennsylvania, Flight 93. And uh, it was a very moving uh, trip for all of them because at the time, Flight 93 uh, was not really being uh, visited. It was just starting to be, uh, you know, sort of a memorial was starting there. So they got a personal tour of 93. And one of the quarries very close to Flight 93 knew of his uh, visit because somehow they knew that this visit was going to take place. And so they volunteered and they provided two pieces of the uh, granite pieces um, really to honor Flight 93. So Ed and Phil and Christian, after they visited Flight 93, they were awarded two pieces of the granite that they are using uh, for this 9-11 memorial. There is some significance here with every part of the memorial, and so I'd like to ask you a few questions about that. There are five brick pillars. Why did you choose five brick pillars, and what is on them? Well, first, the foundation of the structure was purposely done as a pentagon because it represents the pentagon was one of the uh, targets for the terrorists. And then what we did was in each corner, there's five pillars. Uh, one will represent the chiefs, the fire chiefs for the city of Apopka. One will represent the police department. And how they're situated is uh, the fire department actually, it faces the fire department. The police department faces where the police department is at. And these are all the chiefs. And then there's one for the military. And so we kind of face it out into Apopka because we've had a lot of, uh, you know, service people that have joined the military and who fought uh, actually in the two wars of Iraq and Afghanistan. And then we have, um, of course, the pillar that I'm standing on represents the mayors of the city of Apopka. And then the most important one um, for me is the one that faces the structure, the 9-11. Uh, the way that one was placed was that if you go into a map and you do all the you know, directions of where it faces, it faces all the way down into New York City where the Twin Towers once stood and now Freedom, uh, Freedom Tower stands. And there's a very special plaque on, on the pillar facing north to commemorate Christian. It does. Uh, that's his Eagle Scout project, and he won an award for it. Um, and Christian, uh, I, I know he won a very top award for the state of uh, uh, Florida. 
And so that is significant and it gives the story of 9-11 at the big plaque. And then the other plaques that are attached actually recognizes that this is an Eagle Scout project and it did win a state uh, award. It was a recognition and an award for Christian for that plaque. Okay, and now in the center where we have the pieces from the Twin Towers, there's some additional significance or things that you wanted children to remember. Could you tell us a little bit more about the center pieces? Okay, so if you notice, the piece from the Twin Towers sits on two half moon uh, structures and each one is in one of them and each structure represents one of the Twin Towers, Twin Tower North and the Twin Tower South. Then below it, you will see uh, an attachment of ponds on each side. If you go to visit the Freedom Tower in New York, they have the infinity pools and so we have uh, sort of mimicking the same thing where we have some water flowing and water that flows is just in continuous. So it just, it, it really honors everyone that was lost on 9-11. On and um, it's, it's really symbolic of bringing together uh, that tragic day, but also honoring everyone who was lost on that day. And I really want to thank you for your involvement and in coming alongside of our Eagle Scout because this large project won many awards and it really wouldn't have been possible if you hadn't assisted, if the entire city hadn't come together. And we're just so grateful for your involvement in teaching students year after year the significance of the 9-11 Memorial. It's been my honor and it is a privilege and uh, I will always continue to promote this. It's so important for everyone to understand what 9-11 is other than just 9-11. Thank you so much, Commissioner Moore, for bringing this to the students and helping to educate them to understand what 9-11 truly means to all of them. You're so welcome. Thank you. We're here at the Museum of the Popkins with a very special guest, Mary Elizabeth Wheeler. Welcome. Thank you so much for taking time to share with me about some of the earliest of Popkin families. In fact, you're related to many of them. What makes them special and what were some of the hardships that they faced in getting a Popka started as a city? Well, let's start at the beginning when they first came and Nicholas William Prince, who was my great-great-grandfather, moved his family two years after the war between the states from Alabama to Apopka. And they had an adjustment to make, but uh, they, it took them three weeks to travel from Alabama to Apopka, down the Black Warrior River and across the Gulf and into Jacksonville and down up the St. John's and then by wagon over what was not roads, it was ruts. And from reading and what I've heard, uh, things were very difficult at that time. Why do you think they came to this area? They really wanted a new start. Everybody was down after the war between the states and it was tough being in the South. And they wanted to make a new start. So they came to Florida. What kinds of uh, things would they have brought with them on those steamers? Well, they brought a hundred mules that came by land through the woods from Alabama. And before the end of the first year, they'd lost most of those mules. They did not adapt to the heat in Florida. Um, and they, they came with tools and equipment to, to farm. They farmed and grown cotton in Alabama, and they thought they could do that here too. It was a different world, though, because it was a different climate, um, more tropical, and cotton was not happy here growing. But they, they did do that. I can't really tell you what all they planted, but they sustained themselves. They brought cows, chickens, all those things, pots, pans, clothes, beds. Very hardy people. 
Yep. And so tell us about the next family. The next family uh, is when Mary Eliza had just finished in college and came as prepared to be a teacher. Uh, she taught at the lodge, which was where the school was. Um, she had no children at that point. And then Charles Franklin Hires, which was the second name for the family, was she married him and he already had four children uh, from two previous wives that had died in childbirth. So um, then um, they had more children and uh, moved to Texas for a while because he uh, opened a college out in, in uh, Texas. Um, then he died suddenly, so she came with her six children to Florida, back to Florida, because this is where her family was. Um, then she taught again at, um, out at Piedmont. She had twin girls that were four years old, and she put them in the wagon and took them in the wagon to teach in that one-room school. I have pictures of that maybe later that we can share. Um, but all children were in one room, so. We can't even imagine the no. hardship that these early pioneers face. And hearing you talk about them, you realize how the weather, natural disasters, disease, uh, illness, sickness, wars, and there were really, no hospitals. No, no hospitals. You just can't even imagine, and you know how these these tragedies have impacted their lives. But they found a way. They found a way to keep going. Right. Now that the third family, the Starbirds, and I know you're also a descendant right. of the Starbird family. Can you tell us more about them? They came from Maine, also under sort of sad situation. There's one of their sons, 24 year old, had TB, and they were told that if they could, if he could bathe in the waters of the Wekawa River, that uh, he would be healed. Well, he died within a year. It, it didn't do that, but they. Everybody but one son, one son remained in Maine to continue the lumbering operations in Maine, but the rest of them came here and they went into lumbering. Um, and then one of the sons, Adelbert um, Starboard, was the one that was instrumental in getting water and, and um, power to Apopka. Everybody had just wells, pitcher wells, you know, that. And finally, it all and by uh, 1915, they had water into people's homes, which was all of his work. And so he was a very good businessman. And didn't he also rise in the political structure of Apopka? He did. Um, all of the sons were in one office or another. Um, Austin was mayor of Apopka early on in the late 1800s, and. Um, Adelbert was on the Trade Commission, um, and I didn't speak about that with the Prince either, but when Nicholas Prince came, came in 1868, <clears throat> and by 1870, he was, he was superintendent of schools. So, you know, he was really involved in the community. All of them were. I just, there's so, that working together is what we're missing a lot of in our world today. They did, didn't they? You know, they, they had to roll up their sleeves, they had to figure out, they had to make things work, and they learned that you had to, to uh, co collaborate, work together with their other uh, Popkins, because there wasn't anywhere else to go. That's right. And you were telling me that they had to come together and the men did one thing, the women did another. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the, the city council uh, decreed that anyone over 18 years of age and was able-bodied had to work three days a month for the city without pay, doing whatever the task was. And at that time, it was laying the bricks on all the roads in the center of town, which was central to park and, I guess, First Street to Fourth Street, Fifth Street, maybe. But they laid the, the red bricks, and every able-bodied man had to be out there working. And at lunchtime, the wives would come, or the women would come and bring the food for them to eat. And so that's how they got the, the bricks laid in the streets of Apopka. And what about the electricity? Was it a similar situation? 
No, I think that was just um, a creative effort on um, Adelbert Ra um, Starbird's part. He knew that they needed power for business and and for homes. And um, I can't tell you how he knew that or how to go about it, but he did have, make it happen. They had power and in Apopka, and then next they put lines up to Plymouth uh, using just the wooden poles with a cross piece at the top and the insulator, um, the glass insulators to avoid lightning and to pass along the power. Um, it's just incredible to me that with having nothing, they started with nothing and provided power and creature comforts to the community. Well, thank you so much. I can't, I can't thank you enough for all the work you've done here and the preservation for children. And I'm hoping that students will come and do additional research and it'll make a difference in their lives.